All right, let's take a look at the discovery of radioactivity. In the warm-up, it says smoke detectors have a safety hazard symbol like the one on the right. What warning is represented by this symbol? Well, that means that either radioactive materials are handled or radiation producing equipment is used. In 1896, Antoine Vaccarel was investigating fluorescent materials, and Bronkin had recently discovered x-rays, and Vaccarel was curious to know whether fluorescent materials give off these new rays as well as visible light. And this phenomenon was known as fluorescence. And they had interested physicists for quite a while. And fluorescence is the ability of some substances to absorb light at one wavelength and then give off light at a longer wavelength. Um, for example, the coloring on some posters is made of a fluorescent substance and then that substance will absorb ultraviolet light from a black light, and then it will emit bright colors that you can see in the visible range. Um, now, Baccarel was working with potassium uranyl sulfate, and he knew that if he exposed this compound to sunlight and then took it into a dark room, it would fluoresce. And this delayed fluorescence was called phosphorescence. And to find out if the fluorescence included x-rays, he put the sample on a photographic plate. And um, it was completely wrapped in black paper so that no visible light could reach the plate. And when the plate was developed, he noticed that it was fogged. And this indicated that radiation was penetrating the black paper. So was it x-rays that were exposing the film? Well, Baccarel, Baccarel made a really, really important observation. If the uranium compound was left sitting on the paper-covered photographic plate, the plate was exposed whether the compound was fluorescing or not. So he concluded that the uranium compound was emitting the radiation that caused the plate to fog. And this new radiation had nothing to do with fluorescence or phosphorescence. Its discovery was just good luck and good observation. And nobody knew what these new rays were, but they were called Baccarel rays. And scientists found out that they had several properties that were similar to x-rays. They were very penetrating, they exposed photographic plates, they're invisible to the eye, and they cause molecules to become ions. That means they ionize the air. And the property that some substances have of emitting penetrating radiation, which ionizes the air, is known as radioactive uh, radioactivity. And uh, Marie Curie was the one that coined this term, and she showed that all uranium compounds are radioactive. And she concluded that it was the uranium atom itself that was radioactive. Let's talk about other radioactive elements. So Marie Curie made an extremely important contribution to radioactivity. She showed that the element thorium was also radioactive and her and her husband Pierre Curie showed that the radioactivity of an element originated in the atoms of the element. It didn't depend upon any external factors or on the compounds formed by the element. And in their search for other elements that might be radioactive, they examined something called pitch blend ore, which is a mixture that contains uranium oxide. And they found that the degree of radioactivity measured with an apparatus that Pierre invented was a lot um, greater than what would be obtainable from uranium itself. So it appeared that there was an element in this pitch blend ore 
that was more radioactive than uranium. And after they did a lot of different experiments, they isolated a substance that was 400 times the activity of uranium, and they named this polonium, okay? And it's named polonium because Marie Curie is from Poland. And in the same year, in 1898, they discovered another radioactive element in the pitch blend called radium, and that was even more reactive than polonium. And Marie and Pierre Curie were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1903. And um, Marie Curie also won another Nobel Prize in 1911 for chemistry. So she's the only scientist to win two Nobel Prizes for science. And her daughter, Irene Curie, won a Nobel Prize for chemistry in 1935. Let's go on to the FOIL experiment here. Ernest Rutherford worked with J.J. Thompson, who was a discoverer of the electron. And Rutherford and Thompson studied the effect that x-rays had on air. And the air is ionized, and so it produced a um, manner by which x-rays could pass through it. So when Bacquerel rays were discovered, Rutherford was really, really interested in finding out more about them. And at McGill University, Rutherford and his grad students looked at the penetrating power of Bacquerel rays. And they let those rays um, from a sample of uranium pass through various thicknesses of aluminum foil and into a detector. And they used that to um, look at uh, what might be found. And there was a discontinuity when the thickness reached a certain value, which suggested that the Bacquerel rays were made of two different things. One of those things they called the less penetrating rays were alpha rays, and the more penetrating rays were known as beta rays. And the identification of these two types of Bacquerel rays by Rutherford in 1899 was followed by the uh, third type of Bacquerel ray um, discovered by Paul Villard. And he named this gamma radiation. And um, gamma radiation has the ability to pass through several centimeters of lead or several meters of concrete and before it's actually able to be completely stopped. So gamma rays are more penetrating than x-rays. And on the next page, they show you the relative penetration of these types of, um, of rays. OK, let's look at the quick check here. What was Bacquerel looking for when he discovered radioactivity by accident? So he was investigating the nature of fluorescence. Number two, who introduced the term radioactivity? That was Marie Curie. Number three, who first identified alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma radiation? Well, Rutherford was the one that identified alpha and beta particles. And then Villard was the one that identified gamma rays. So what are alpha, beta, and gamma radiation? So um, when these different types of radiation are passed through a magnetic field, like you have right here, then if the field is strong enough, it can separate the three types of radiation. So here you'll notice that you have your Bacquerel rays being directed through a small region that has a magnet, 
and the alpha radiation was deflected in one direction and the beta radiation was deflected in the opposite direction and the gamma radiation just wasn't affected at all by the magnetic field. Now the beta radiation was affected in the same way as cathode rays. And cathode rays were composed of electrons, which were negatively charged, which meant that beta radiation carried a negative charge. And since alpha radiation was deflected in the opposite direction, it obviously carried a positive charge. And Bacquerel used the technique of J.J. Thompson's to measure the charge to mass ratio of beta radiation. And the result that he obtained was that this was the same as it was for electrons. So that meant that beta radiation were electrons. And then experiments with alpha particles indicated that they were much more massive than beta particles or electrons. And the magnitude of their charge was equal to or twice that of an electron. So it suggested that an alpha particle might be a hydrogen molecule with a single positive charge or a helium atom with a double positive charge. And Rutherford and Royds carried out an experiment to find out whether alpha particles were in fact helium atoms that were missing two electrons. And Rutherford, Rutherford and Royds knew that radon gas was radioactive and gave off alpha particles. And the experiment that they did was they passed radon gas into a very thin walled glass tube, as you can see here in this figure. And there's an outer glass tube that contains the radon, I'm sorry, surrounding the radon filled tube. And it was evacuated with a vacuum pump. And the outer tube had two electrodes. And it was, those electrodes were built into it. And after a few days, enough alpha particles from the radioactive radon had escaped through the thin walled container. So here is your radioactive radon gas in here with its thin walled glass tube, okay? And um, it escapes through that thin walled container into the outer container. Okay. And the contents of the outer container could be tested. So they tested what was in here. And a high voltage was applied to the two electrodes and the discharge that occurred was then examined with a spectroscope. And the spectral lines that were the spectral lines that were observed were actually identical to the spectrum of helium gas. So alpha particles um, were helium atoms with two electrons that were missing. Let's go on to the next page and talk about gamma radiation. So gamma radiation is very penetrating and it's not deflected by a magnetic or an electric field. And Rutherford and Andre used a new technique involving diffraction by crystals to measure the wavelength of gamma radiation. And this convinced Rutherford and Andre that gamma radiation was like x-rays. It was just a form of electromagnetic radiation and it traveled at the speed of light. And the wavelengths of gamma radiation were shorter than the wavelengths of x-ray radiation. So gamma rays discovered in 1900 by Villard were finally identified in 1914 by Rutherford and Andre. And um, all of the evidence that was gathered by Bacquerel, the Curies, Thompson, Rutherford, um, that all suggested that radioactives actually threw out pieces of themselves and they came from the nucleus. So let's take a look here at the quick check. Number one says, what effect does the magnetic field have on a beam of radiation containing a mixture of alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays. 
Well, the gamma rays aren't attracted nor repelled by magnets, but the alpha particles are attracted to the north end of magnets, while beta particles are attracted to the south end of a magnet. Number two, who showed that beta particles were actually electrons? So Baccarel measured the charge to mass ratio of beta particles, which was the same as that of the electron. Number three, who showed that gamma radiation was actually electromagnetic radiation like light and x-rays? What kind of experiment did this require? Well, Rutherford and Andrade used crystal diffraction to measure the wavelength of gamma radiation. Let's move on to what happens to a radioactive atom. So many scientists occupied themselves trying to figure out what happened during radioactive decay of elements like uranium and thorium, polonium and radium. And in 1900, William Crookes made a surprising discovery. When a uranium sample is purified, its radioactivity actually decreased, which was puzzling. And it was thought for a while that maybe the impurity in the uranium that was radioactive rather than the uranium itself. But shortly after, Baccarel repeated this experiment and he obtained the same result. And he found that if the originally pure sample was left standing, it regained its activity. And eventually it became as radioactive as previous measurements of uranium had indicated. And in 1902, Rutherford and Frederick Soddy found that thorium showed the same behavior as uranium. And they purified it and its activity became very low initially, but on standing for a while, the sample recovered its activity. So Rutherford and Soddy drew a startling conclusion and they said that when a radioactive atom like uranium gives off radioactive particles, the uranium atom changes into an atom of a different element altogether. And this new atom gives off radioactive particles and becomes another element. So the increasing radioactivity of the uranium sample was due to the growing concentration of these radioactive daughter elements. And the daughter elements were more radioactive than the parent atoms, so the radioactivity increased from the time the pure uranium was actually left standing. Now, let's go on to natural transmutations. Now, the process of changing one element into another through radioactive decay is called transmutation. And this work by Rutherford and Soddy verified what that transmutation did occur when alpha and beta particles are given off by a radioactive element. And that's how Rutherford won the Nobel Prize in 1908. And um, we're going to skip 
probing atoms with alpha particles just underneath here. And we are going to also cross out the Rutherford model of the atom, which you've actually talked about previously. And we're going to cross out the discovery of the neutron. And we're going to go here to the quick check. And we're just going to look at quick check question number one. What is natural transmutation? This is changing one element into another through radioactive decay. Now, let's go on to nuclear reactions here. Nuclear reactions involve changing the atomic nucleus. And radioactivity is beyond our control. It just happens spontaneously in the formation of a new nucleus with a different atomic number. So you have a new element forming. And during nuclear reactions, um, certain symbols are used to represent subatomic particles. Um, for instance, um, here we have um, in this chart a subscript that's indicating the electric charge that's carried by a particle, and the superscript indicates the number of nucleons, which are neutrons plus protons, that are in the particle. Um, and if we are looking at uranium-238, undergoing radioactive decay and it gives off an alpha particle. Here is your uranium-238 forming your alpha particle here and the four should combine with a number to give you 238 for uranium. That's how you figure out this 234. And the two on the helium should combine with a number to give you the 92 atomic number for uranium here. So two plus 90 is 92, four plus 234 is 238. Um, then, and that's an example of alpha decay, when you have an alpha particle on the product side. Beta decay is when you're gonna produce a beta particle on the product side. So here, this is thorium decaying, and you're gonna produce a beta particle, which is this here. And 0 plus a number would equal 234. This negative 1 plus a number would give you 90. So negative 1 and 91 give you 90. You look at the atomic number 91 on the periodic table to get the element Pa to include there. So that's your beta decay. Now, let's go on and talk about isotopes. You know that isotopes are atoms of the same element with different number of neutrons. And there are some isotopes that have specific names. And there are three isotopes of hydrogen. Um, we have normal hydrogen, we have deuterium, which is hydrogen 2, and tritium, which is hydrogen 3. Um, deuterium oxide is known as heavy water, and it's used in nuclear reactors, and tritium is radioactive. Um, a radioisotope um, is an isotope that's unstable, so that makes it radioactive, and it has many uses in medicine, biology, nuclear reactors, they have them in pacemakers, and dating substances or weapons. And radioactive carbon-14 um, is found in small amounts in nature, wherever carbon is found. And um, it's also in the gas carbon dioxide. And carbon-14 decays, and we can use it to date ancient objects that contain carbon-containing uh, compounds. And we can use the amount of carbon-14 that's remaining. They used it to figure out how old the Dead Sea Scrolls were. And um, let's move on here to talk about uranium. So uranium has several isotopes, and all of them are radioactive. 
And the most abundant isotope of uranium is uranium-238. Um, other isotopes would be uranium-233, 234, and 235. If you take a look here at the quick check, it says, what are isotopes, how are they the same, and how are they different? So isotopes are atoms of the same element with different numbers of neutrons. How are they different? How are they the same? So they're the same because they have the same number of protons, but they're different because they have different numbers of neutrons. What is a radioisotope? This is an unstable radioactive isotope. Number three, explain in detail what this symbol means. So U is the symbol for uranium. That's the element symbol. And then in the upper left-hand corner, this 235, 238, excuse me, this is your mass number. This is your protons plus your neutrons. And then 92 in the lower left-hand corner, this is your atomic number which is the number of protons. Okay, for number four, it says complete these nuclear reactions. Okay, so in A, what plus 222 is going to give you 226? That would have to be a four. And then what this is a typo here. This atomic number on Rn should be an 86 in your text. What plus 86 would be 88? Well, that would be a 2. Look at uh, number atomic number 2 on your periodic table, and that's helium. So since this is a helium nucleus, this is an example of alpha emission, okay, or alpha, or alpha decay. For B, what number plus 214 is 214? That would be a zero. What number plus 83 is 82? That's a negative one. So this would be beta emission because this is a beta particle. And then for C, we've got four plus what max number is 218? That would be 214. And then 2 plus what is 84? 2 plus 82 is 84. Look at number 82 on the periodic table, and that is lead PB. And since this is a helium nucleus, this is also an alpha emission or alpha decay equation. For D, 0 plus what number is 210? 210. Negative 1 plus what number is 83? 84. Look at number 84 on the periodic table and it is PO polonium. And since this is a beta particle, because it's an electron, this is beta emission or beta decay. Okay, now let's talk about half-lives of isotopes. So the rate at which a radioactive decay can be measured is expressed in terms of the time it takes for half of the radioactive atoms to decay. So the time for half the atoms to um, decay that are in a radioactive sample is called the half-life. And the half-life of uranium-238 is 4.5 billion years. So what that means is if you have a sample of uranium-238 with 1,000 atoms, after 4.5 billion years, 500 of those, of those atoms will have decayed to thorium-234. And then thorium-234 decays into another element, which in turn decays into another element, and so on. And um, some of these elements have half-lives that are much shorter than 4.5 billion years, like a minute, for instance. Um, and the half-life of a sample of an element is determined by measuring its activity. 
in emissions per second over time. And an emission per second is known as a Bacharel, okay? And if you take a look at the next page, they give you a table of half-lives of some common substances, tritium, carbon-14, oxygen-15, cobalt-60, and a few other substances. And what we want to do is let's take a look at a practice problem on the next page here. Practice problem number one. It says that thorium-234 has a half-life of 24 days. How many atoms from a 4,000 atom sample will still be will still be thorium-234 after a period of 144 days. So if we're looking at a period of 144 days, divide it by its half-life, which is 24 days, and that's going to give you six half-lives. So if we take the 4,000 atom sample that we originally started with, and we divide it by two, you will have 2,000 atoms left after the first half-life. So that would be 24 days that had passed by. Then if you take that 2,000 atoms that you have at the end of the first half-life and you divide it by two, you'll get 1,000 atoms after the second half-life. And then if you take that 1,000 atoms and you divide it by two again, that's going to give you 500 atoms at the third half-life. And then if you take those 500 atoms and divide it by two, it will be 250 at the fourth half-life. And then the 250 atoms divided by two will give you 125 atoms at the fifth half-life. I think you get the idea. And then 125, let's put that over here, atoms divided by two is going to give you 62.5 atoms at the end of that sixth half-life. And that would be your answer. Let's go on to radioactive series. So uranium-238 decays to thorium-234, and then th to thorium-234 decays to protactinium-234, and then that decays to uranium-234, and the series of decays doesn't end there. And if you look at the figure on the next page, which is this one, you will notice that um, eventually you end up decaying all the way to lead 206. And um, this is an example of a radioactive series. So when an alpha particle is emitted during radioactive decay, atoms of a new element are formed with an atomic number that's two less than the original and a mass number that's four less. And then if you emit a beta particle like they are here, um, the new element has the same mass number but a different atomic number that's one higher. And if gamma rays are emitted, they don't affect the atomic number or the mass number.